Yes. It is it's now time for question period. I recognize the Deputy Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is uh, for the Premier. Uh, for most Ontarians, the cost of living has skyrocketed under this Conservative government. Since June 2018, the cost of buying a home in Ontario has doubled, now costing over $1 million. The average cost of rent has gone up $200 a month. Families are spending more in the grocery store. And under this premier, the price of gas has gone up 19 per cent, along with home heating, which is now up 18 per cent. Speaker, so when will the premier stop with the gimmicks and take real action to help everyday Ontarians struggling with out-of-control costs of living? Thank you. I recognize the member for Richmond Hill, Aurora, Aurora. Oak Ridges. We got it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for the uh, question, Mr. Speaker. Here's the difference between uh, a party and a government that puts people first, Mr. Speaker, that is fighting every single day to reduce costs and make life more affordable. And what you see from and you hear from the opposition day after day, Mr. Speaker, they'll talk about minimum wage. We'll raise minimum wage to $15, and what do they do? They vote against it, Mr. Speaker. We lower cost and we fight for those jobs to come to Ontario so that we can raise uh, every single person in this province, Mr. Speaker. What does the opposition do? They vote against it. They'll come time after time and they'll talk about uh, making life more affordable for Ontarians. And then every time we, we actually put tangible uh, b uh, work towards making a difference in people's lives, the opposition votes against it. So there's a clear contrast, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to Answer. fight for those jobs in Ontario. We'll continue to make more life more affordable for Ontarians while the Thank opposition you. continues to say no. Thank you. I recognize the deputy leader. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the Premier forgets that wages uh, for about a million workers in this province are frozen thanks to Bill 124. For hundreds of thousands of frontline grocery store clerks and retail and service workers, there have been no gains for them because of the low minimum wage here in the province of Ontario. For Ontarians stuck with this Premier's low wage policies, just trying to make ends meet is hard enough. Just to pay the increase in rent alone, Speaker, a minimum, age, a minimum wage worker would have to work an additional 13 hours a month. With this Premier's low-wage policies, why is this government making it harder and harder for working people to have a roof over their head? I recognize the parliamentary assistant. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, I thank my colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, quite the contrary. Every single day. What we are doing is to make sure that life is more affordable for the people of this province, Mr. Speaker. And in contrast, what the opposition does is continuously fight and oppose every measure that we put in. I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, as a result of us raising minimum wage, Mr. Speaker, more than 760,000 Ontarians were, are now able to take a bigger paycheck. And you know what's going to happen in October, Mr. Speaker? That's going to be raised to a 1550, so a further bigger paycheck, Mr. Speaker, for Ontarians. We'll fight every single day for every single Ontarian, Mr. Speaker. While the previous government gave up on Ontarians, while the previous government gave up on jobs for Ontarians, we want not only jobs, we want good paying jobs to come back in this province for every single Ontarian, Mr. Speaker. And we'll fight yeah, every sure. day. They didn't get it done, they supported them. We'll get it done, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. I'd like to remind my colleague that this government froze the minimum wage when they took office in 2018, making sure that workers didn't get the pay bump that they deserved. Um, and let's be clear, you have done nothing to make housing more affordable, nothing for renters, and nothing for seniors who drive. There's nothing on offer for folks who can't afford high car insurance and no relief for high hydro prices. Speaker, it doesn't have to be this way. We could have a government that is working to make life more affordable, starting with affordable homes for families in my city of Brampton and starting with an end to the Premier's low-wage policies. Speaker, when will this government stop with the election gimmicks and start tackling the high cost of living here in the province of Ontario? Thank you. 
I recognize the parliamentary assistant, Commissioner of Finance. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank again my colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Minister, Minister for Municipal Housing and Affairs because he's been a champion in this province, Mr. Speaker. The problems that the NDP just woke up to discuss today, this minister identified and this premier talked about the very first day. They acknowledged the, pre the previous government's failed policies year after year after year. But Mr. Speaker, the problems that we're facing today was because they failed the people of Ontario. And don't forget, Mr. Speaker, when the opposition, the NDP, had a balance of power, what did they do? They also failed the people of this province, Mr. Speaker, but not under the, under the leadership of this minister and not this premier. We will continue to work hard every single day to make life more affordable for Ontarians. That means better paying jobs, Mr. Speaker. That means affordable housing, Mr. Speaker. That means Answer. more housing all across the province, from corner to corner to corner, for every Ontario under the leadership of this government, this Premier and that Minister. Thank you. New question I recognize the Deputy Leader for Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. For people in Ontario, the wait in the emergency room can be painfully long, some waiting hours and hours. The wait for a family doctor can be weeks. The wait for surgery is now several months long or even some years for some folks. This morning, the uh, FAO laid bare the reasons behind these long waits. Ontario spends less per person on health care than anywhere else in Canada. Shame. Much less, Speaker. 10 per cent less than the average. My question to the Premier is, why does this government believe that Ontarians deserve less health care funding than everywhere else in Canada? I recognize the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. This government has invested more in health care than any government in Ontario's history. We've uh, invested an extra $5 billion, and during COVID-19, an extra $5 billion on top of that. We have been investing more in health care and in hospitals and in doctors. As you know, we just announced 294 medical spots. 95 medical spots, um, with some uh, assigned to the Northern Ontario Medical School, which is very important for making sure that we have the resources up in the north and in rural and remote communities. We're doing everything we can to make sure that people have access to hospitals, to health care across the province and in when and where they need it. Exactly. Supplementary. Um, speaker, this is not a, a new problem, and frankly, the numbers, they don't lie. The previous Liberal government started the process of bringing health care to its knees. They froze hospital budgets for five years and laid off more than 1,600 nurses. But what has the current government done? They cut. They withhold funding. They put in place low-wage policies like Bill 124, disrespecting health professionals and driving them out of the province of Ontario. Speaker, my question to the Premier is why is he driving away health care professionals instead of fixing our health care system? Thank you. I recognize the parliamentary assistant. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite for the question. Quite to the contrary, this government has invested in the largest health human resource recruitment initiative in Ontario's history. We have 27,000. Um, PSWs and nurses uh, going into long-term care to fulfill our four hours of care on average per resident promise. We have recruited another 8,000 nurses and PSWs uh, for hospitals and home care. And we have, as I just mentioned, 295 new places for doctors uh, across the province. And that is the first uh, increase in doctor placements in 10 years in this province. So we are doing everything we can to make sure that the resources are there for people who need them. And uh, we have been adding pandemic pay to our frontline health care heroes throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, pandemic, and we recently uh, contributed $763 million Answer. to nurses to have a $5,000 bonus. Good. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, here's the reality of the situation. Ontario has the fewest beds per person. Ontario has the fewest registered nurses per person, and in my beautiful city of Brampton, we only have one emergency room for over 700,000 people. In the north and rural communities, people are forced to drive hours for care, and for many First Nations people, they are actually forced to fly out of their community to access a hospital. Everyone in this province deserves so much better. 
Investing in public universal health care is a good investment, Speaker. It actually helps governments save money in the long term. Why is this government underfunding and withholding money from our health care system rather than investing in it? Thank you. I recognize the parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite for the question. As I've indicated through my other two answers, uh, this government has done more investment in health care than any other government in Ontario's history. But what, what has the opposition done? The opposition who supported the Liberals for 15 years, well, they did nothing and invested in nothing and left our health care system in this current state. The NDP have opposed our government's commitment to protecting people's health at every turn, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. We provided investments of more than a billion dollars to support the rollout of Ontario's vaccine plan. They voted no. They didn't support us when we invested over $1.8 billion in the hospital sector in 21-22. Or, or our $125 million to expand critical care capacity across the province. They voted no. We invested Answer. over half a billion dollars to surgical recovery. They didn't support it. Opposing our government is really all this opposition party is, is able to do. That's why they're going to be forever in opposition. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, I recognize the member for Poetno. Uh, good morning. My question is to the Premier. In July 2020, the government directed uh, Children's Aid Society to stop using birth alerts targeting Indigenous women by October 2020. A year and a half after this directive was given, we are still hearing from the Metawa Chiefs Council that this practice continues. Now, instead of apprehension based on the birth alerts, they are happening through the duty to report. Speaker, birth alerts are a gross violation of the rights of the child, the rights of the mother, and the Indigenous community as a whole. Will the Premier tell this House Question. how the government has ensured that the birth alert directive of 2020 was implemented? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Community, Children and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government is listening and taking tangible steps to combat systemic racism, including in Ontario's child welfare system. In 2020, the ministry directed children's aid societies to end the practice of birth alerts, which partners told us dis disproportionately affected First Nations, Inuit, and Métis families and communities. No woman should be deterred from seeking prenatal care or parenting, parenting supports while pregnant due to fears of having a birth alert issued. Eliminating birth alerts is an important step in creating a child welfare system that responds to the needs of children, youth and families through prevention and early intervention. And I thank the member again for the question. Thank you. Supplementary, member for Quetno. My speaker, um, I've had my taste of colonial tea in this place. Speaker, uh, in 2014, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission called upon all levels of government to reduce the number of Indigenous children in care. In 2019, the, indigenous, uh, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls recommended the abolish abolishment of uh, birth alerts. Child welfare involvement, birth alerts, and other institutional policies and practices that target Indigenous families have very real effects on our nations. Speaker, is Ontario's 2020 directive just birth alerts under the different name? Can Ontario, can Ontario ensure Indigenous families that the colonial, oppressive and discriminatory practice of birth alerts are not still being used against Indigenous families. Thank you. I return the member for Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, and again, no woman should be discouraged from seeking prenatal care or parenting supports out of fear that their child will be taken from them. We've heard from Indigenous and other racialized communities that this practice separates newborns and parents shortly after delivery and unfairly affects racialized and marginalized mothers 
and families. Ending birth alerts was a key recommendation of the National Inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And instead of immediately separating families and making assumptions about a mother's capacity, we are directing children's aid societies and hospitals to collaborate and create new protocols that support vulnerable mothers and families. Ending birth alerts, let me be clear, Answer. is a critical step in creating a child welfare system that is focused on prevention and early intervention. Thank you again for the question. Thank you. I recognize the member for Whitby. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, Ontarians continue to be concerned with the cost of living. It's no secret, though, Speaker, that for 15 long years, past Liberal governments imposed unjust cost burdens on Ontarians, including, Speaker, putting costly tolls on drivers in my community. So can the Minister of Transportation please tell the House what this government is doing to right the wrongs of the Liberals and keep costs down for hard-working Ontario families? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Whitby for such a great question and for being such a great advocate on behalf of his constituents. <laughs> Speaker, when our government took office four years ago, we made a commitment, a commitment to reverse the costly policies that were enacted by the Del Duca Win Liberals and to keep more of your hard earned money in your pocket where it belongs. Last month, Speaker, I was pleased to stand with the Premier and members of our caucus to announce that we are delivering on our promise to the people of Durham to remove the unfair tolls that Stephen Del Duca and the Liberals imposed and to cut costs for drivers in the region. Speaker, I am so pleased to say that as of yesterday, tolls on highways 12, 412 and 418 are officially gone for good. Answer. One less dent in your pocket when you take your kids to school, commute to work. Mr. Speaker, we are not re repeating the past mistakes of the Liberals. We are putting, we are saying yes to putting and keeping more money in your pocket. Thank you. I would ask the member for Ottawa South to come to order, please. I recognize the member for Whitby. Well, thank you, Speaker. I'd like to uh, thank the Minister of Transportation for that response and her uh, long-standing leadership and commitment to remove the tolls on the 412 and 418. <laughs> Speaker, I know that this is a long time coming for drivers in my riding who were ignored by the Liberals for years yep. on this issue. Speaker, years. Instead of listening to voices in my community and across this entire province, the Liberals took every chance to make life more expensive John. and, Speaker, more difficult for Ontarians. So can the Minister of Transportation please tell the House more about what this government is doing to cut costs for drivers in other areas? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. I recognize the member, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for the question. Speaker, when our government took office in 2018, we inherited a disastrous situation from the Liberals. But you don't have to take my word for it, for it Speaker. Just look at their record. Under Stephen Del Duca and the Liberals, electricity rates were skyrocketing. 300,000 manufacturing jobs had left the province. And, Speaker, when Mr. Del Duca was Minister of Transportation, license plate st sticker fees rose by nearly 10 per cent per year. But our government is correcting their wrongs. We're taking concrete steps that will save drivers precious time and money. Order. We're saying yes to removing the tolls from highways 412 and 418. We're saying yes to eliminating license plate renewal fees and stickers. We're saying yes to building Answer. future highways 413 and the Bradford Bypass toll-free. And yes to cutting ta the gas tax by 5.7 cents per litre, Speaker. And what do we hear from the NDP and the Liberals on the other side of the House, Thank Mr. You. Speaker? No, every single time. Thank you. I recognize the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, 
In the middle of the pandemic, while many small businesses were forced to shut down and many more Ontarians lost their jobs, this government gave the owners of Highway 407 a billion-dollar write-off. Recently, there have been calls to help drivers by getting more vehicles off the 401 using existing roads. The City of Mississauga unanimously passed a resolution calling on this government to reduce traffic on the 401 by lowering tolls on the 407. So instead of spending $10 billion to build Highway 413, will the Premier give drivers a break and get his buddies to lower tolls on the 407? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, congestion is a problem that affects all of us in this House and people across the province of Ontario. It affects our quality of life. It impacts um, the cost of goods. It impacts costs, adds costs for businesses. Highway 401, Speaker, is the most congested highway in North America. For, de for years, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals had the chance to address this issue. They didn't build new subways, and when they built new highways in the Greater Golden Horseshoe, they, bid, they, they built, bid, built them with tolls, Mr. Speaker. We want to put money back into people's pockets, which is why we remove the tolls from the highways 412 and 418. We want to get people moving. We want to get people where they need to go, which is why our Greater Golden Horseshoe Transportation Plan addresses the gridlock that the Liberals let develop year after year after year. Congestion is only going to get worse, Speaker, as the population Answer. of the Greater Golden Horseshoe increases, which is why we are taking steps to increase our highway capacity by building Highway 413 and the Bradford Bypass toll-free. Thank you. I return to the member for Hummer River Black Street. Thank you, Thank you Speaker. The Auditor General has confirmed that she'll be looking into the billion-dollar handout this government gave to the private corporation who owns Highway 407, and I'm sure that a report will be enlightening. Speaker, the 407 runs just north of my community. It was originally designed as an outlet to direct traffic away from the 401, but few people in my community actually use it because of the expensive tolls. But instead of taking action to reduce these tolls, the Premier gave the owners of the 407 a billion-dollar write-off. Wow. Now he's going to spend another $10 billion to build a highway through the Green Belt to help his developer buddies, who are some of his biggest owners, make even more money. For once, will the Premier do the right thing and put the interests of everyday Ontarians ahead of the interests of multi-billion dollar corporations? Thank you. I return to the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to tell the member opposite that our government is doing the right thing. We're taking action in ways that the Liberals and the NDP won't do. We are building the infrastructure that people need to end congestion in the Greater Golden Horseshoe, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, MTO has been looking at the gridlock problem for decades. The GTA West study, GTA West Corridor Stage 1 Environmental ass Assessment looked at all the alternatives. Under this EA, modelling showed that if Highway 413 is not built, the 407 would be at or above capacity by 2013, even if the tolls remained, Mr. Speaker. That means that we need to get building today. We need to build a Highway 413. We need to build the Bradford Bypass. Mr. Speaker, we are a pro-transit government. Answer. We're investing $61 billion in transit to build new subways, new LRTs. Speaker, we are, we, are we are taking the steps. We are showing the leadership in transportation that the Liberals did not for years, condemning generations of Ontarians to congestion. We are going to do what's right. Thank We're you. Saying yes to build. I recognize the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'm sure, like the rest of us here, we'd all like to know where the pixie dust is being spread today. We all know the Premier likes to promise big things, really big things, and not deliver, and really not deliver, like a 20 per cent income tax cut or a 12 per cent reduction on your hydro rates. Now with Bill 88, he's promising that he's uh, working for workers. Instead, he's making them second-class workers under the Employment Standards Act. Workers who don't have the same rights and protections that all Ontario workers have fought for and deserve. So, Speaker, when will the Premier stop saying things just because they sound really good Question. and actually deliver on the protections that Ontario's gig workers need? I recognize the government House Leader. So, Mr. Speaker, let, let's look at what he just said there. When will the Premier stop announcing things that sound good? So, if they sound good, it means that they must be good for the people of the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. I guess that that's what it means, right? 
So the member opposite thinks that reducing taxes for the people of the province of Ontario is not something that we should be doing, that it's too good for the people of the province of Ontario, that providing better protection for workers in the province of Ontario is something that they didn't do over 15 years, that the workers don't deserve it. That's what the Liberals think, Mr. Speaker. We don't, Mr. Speaker. That reducing the gas tax for the people of the province of Ontario at a time when carbon taxes, war in Ukraine is hurting all of our economy, Mr. Speaker, they think it's too rich Answer. to put more money back in the pockets of the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And that is fundamentally the difference between the Liberals and the NDPs and a coalition. We believe in putting money back in the pockets of people Thank to you. build a strong economy where people can live, work, invest, and raise a family. Thank and there's no better place in North America to do it than Ontario right now under this strong, Thank stable, progressive conservative majority. Thank you. I return to the member for Ottawa South. Thank you, Speaker. I don't think my colleague across the way got it. It's actually the Premier saying things that he's doing, like a 20% income tax cut or 12% off your hydro heat. I don't know about you, but if you guys think they've happened, maybe you should go and knock on a few doors. So, Speaker, the Working for Workers Act doesn't actually work for workers. And in fact, this government, this is a government that likes to say no. They order. want to say no the to Minister protections for their health and safety. And no to order. vacation pay, no to termination pay, no to rights to organize, no to a fair living wage. And just like the Ontario Autism Program and so many other things, the Premier likes to say big things, really big things, and promise big things, and then come up short, really short, or not at all. So, Speaker, when will the Premier stock, stop talking the big talk and actually deliver real rights and Question. protections to gig workers in Ontario. I recognize the government host leader. Again, Mr. Speaker, let's go back to 2018. 2018, before we were elected, Mr. Speaker, we saw jobs and investment fleeing the province of Ontario because of the policies of the Liberals and the NDP, Mr. Speaker. They never saw a regulation that they didn't like. They put on regulations. We were twice as regulated as any other province in the country, Mr. Speaker. Jobs were fleeing. And what has happened since we have come to office? Not only are we making important investments in health care, including in his own community. His own, his own government, he was parliamentary assistant, refused to put investments into the Ottawa hospital. It took us to get that done, Mr. Speaker. Us to get it done. We're cutting taxes for people. That's what conservatives do. More money in their pockets, Mr. Speaker. Jobs are coming back to Ontario. We've saved the auto sector, Mr. Speaker. We're building transit and transportation. And you know what? When we build transit and transportation, it works. We don't build bridges upside down like the Liberals did, Mr. Speaker. Ontario is getting back to work because of a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority. And after June the second, they'll get another one. Order. Start the clock. Next question. I recognize the member from Peterborough Forest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in honour of uh, National Tartan today, I am wearing my family tartan, McPherson. Hey, hey. <laughs> my question is uh, for the President of the Treasury Board. My constituents have heard that the government's plan to stay open includes adding 3,000 new beds over 10 years and the continuation of the over 3,100 beds in hospitals that were added during the pandemic. Mr. Speaker, my constituents have sacrificed so much during this pandemic and want to know more about how this government is fixing the failure of the previous government. To the President of the Treasury Board, how will this legislation and a plan to stay open protect Ontarians for generations to come? Thank you. I recognize the Parliamentary Assistant for the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Peterborough Kawartha for that question. The member is correct. Through the Minister of Health, we are investing over $30 billion wow. over the next 10 years to address long-standing challenges in our hospital created by the former Liberal government. In addition, since the offset of this pandemic, the government has added nearly a thousand more intensive care hospital beds. And Speaker, after a decade and a half of neglect, the people of Peel Region are finally getting the new hospitals they deserve. Here, here. Last December, we announced the largest investment in hospital infrastructure in Canadian history to completely rebuild the Mississauga Hospital in Mississauga Lakeshore. And last Sunday, the Premier announced another $21 million to invest in expanding the William Osler Health 
system. Answer? This funding will transform Peel Medical into a new inpatient hospital for 24-7 emergency department and expanding cancer care for Thank Brampton you. Civic Hospital. Thank you, Thank you. I return to the member for Peterborough Forza. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Treasury Board to Representative, the member from Mississauga Lakeshore, for that answer. It's really important that we build on the lessons that we've learned from COVID-19. And I'm pleased to hear that we're actually doing that. I can't believe that after 15 years of liberal inaction, we're actually getting hospitals built, something that is completely foreign to what the previous government did. I think that the answer highlights another important area for me, though, and that's training future healthcare practitioners in Ontario. It's great to have new beds, but we need nurses, we need doctors to actually be there to make sure that people are getting the care that they deserve. It's also important that we're attracting and retrain, retaining other medical professionals. Can the minister please tell the House how these initiatives will help Ontario weather for future emergencies? Thank you. I recognize the parliamentary assistant. Thank you again for the, uh, from the member for that question. To stay open, we need to retain as many staff as possible, re retraining them for more, more people and breaking down barriers for skilled workers that they choose to stay here in Ontario. Through the new Ontario Learn and Stay grant, up to 2,500 students will be eligible to receive here, here. full upfront funding for tuitions, books, and other things for education. To, and as well, that will keep them here in, in the uh, graduated areas that they want to work in. Great. We are also supporting foreign trained medical professionals by proposing an amendment for the international trained health care workers can receive certification for the regulated colleges in the timely manner and start working as soon as possible. Finally, we are also building the health care workforce for tomorrow by adding 160 new upgraded seats and 295 new postgraduate positions across the six medical schools in Ontario over the next five years. I want to thank the Minister of Answer. Colleges and Universities and the Minister of Health for all their work that they are doing to help us rebuild the system that was neglected thank by you. the previous Liberal government. Yeah. We are getting it. I recognize the member for Muskegawak, James Bay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. For almost four years, uh, I've been holding this government accountable for the lack of services in French. However, this situation hasn't improved. Many uh, of my uh, constituents uh, have said that they haven't had access to services in French for government services. Monsieur Bertrand, in my writing, attempted to have access to a driver's uh, uh, testing and he called he was told he would get services in French he paid a hotel he paid for the gas to make it to his appointment but once he arrived at his appointment no one was there to speak to him in French and he was denied access to French uh, to services in French monsieur Bertrand didn't wasn't uh, successful for his uh, driving exam why did monsieur Bertrand have this experience and how do you explain this lack of service in French? Minister of Francophone Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud to be part of a government that has, for the first time, modernized the French Language Services Act in the province of Ontario after it was presented and tabled in 1990. The Liberals had 15 years to modernize this act that is so important for francophones in Ontario and it's our government that uh, was able to modernize uh, that uh, act and of course uh, it was proclaimed uh, this past year in addition to modernizing the act we've also implemented measures uh, to improve uh, capacity and to improve uh, services and also to retain and recruit uh, the workforce, the francophone workforce, uh, there's a shortage of workers and that's why we're doing everything that we can to reinforce uh, the francophone workforce in order to provide these services. But this issue is something that we take very seriously and I'll be happy to speak to the member about this issue. The member for uh, Meshkegawak Bay James. Um, Thank you for the minister's response, but the situation isn't improving. Another uh, of my constituents that has been frustrated, same scenario, she made uh, calls, so she made an appointment in French uh, to request services in French, and once again, when she arrived in Sudbury, 
They, she was told that uh, the services weren't available in French. That's completely unacceptable. And that uh, person also failed uh, her test. And people on ODSP are only receiving $1,200. It's unacceptable that services aren't available in French. And it's unacceptable that people have to deal with such a scenario. And we don't even have these services in uh, the uh, urban or in rural regions. What is the Premier doing to improve the situation? And are you aware of all everything that you're causing Ontarians to suffer from? The Minister of Francophone Affairs, honestly, we've been open to the issues uh, with French language services, and that's why we modernized the French Language Services Act for the first time since the 80s. I understand the frustrations of a number of Ontarians when it comes to uh, driving testing. We uh, suspended those uh, tests during the pandemic, and I presented a very bold investment of $16 million to increase the number of drive tests. We hired uh, uh, trainers and testers uh, in order to provide these services uh, and add hours, uh, extended hours, uh, that includes regions in the north and for Francophone communities. We've modernized uh, the drive test for G-Class licenses to ensure that all Ontarians, Francophones and Anglophones can have access to these uh, drive test appointments. Is a member for Cambridge. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. My question is for the Premier. Recently, this government finally admitted that they will fail to deliver on another promise from their 2018 election campaign to reduce gas and fuel taxes in their first term in office. Another promise made and promise broken. During the 2018 election campaign, the Premier promised to bring in tax relief by cutting the provincial tax on gas and fuel in his first term in office. By November of 2021, with this promise still not fulfilled, the Premier said a cut in gas taxes would come before the next budget. But now, the budget, budget is on its way, and the government has stated that only a temporary cut in gas and fuel taxes would come, and only if they are re-elected. Looking back on the last four years of a wasted opportunity, why did the government not keep its commitment to cut the provincial tax on gas and fuel during its first term in office? Thank you. I recognize the parliament, parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank my, uh, my colleague for the question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're introducing legislation, uh, Mr. Speaker, that if passed, would temporarily cut the tax by 5.7 cents per litre, Mr. Speaker. That is on top of the 4.3 cents that has already been um, that has already been cut, Mr. Speaker, for Ontarians. These savings, Mr. Speaker, coupled with the recently announced elim elimination of the license plate fees, Mr. Speaker, would save Ontario households $465 uh, per year in 2022, Mr. Speaker. My question is to my colleague: Why isn't she and all members in the opposition aren't helping us and fighting the carbon tax, which is adding so much cost and burden to Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. Once again, we're fighting every, every day to make sure we lower the cost for Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. The opposition does the opposite and always votes against every initiative we put forward. Turn to the member for Cambridge for the supplementary. Oh, they keep talking about the carbon tax and they've implemented their own. Speaker, a cut to the provincial tax on gas and fuel would have been of great help to Ontarians over the last four years, especially as this government and its forced lockdowns and mandates shuttered businesses and put people out of work. But this government failed and broke its promise. Now they have admitted that under a PC government, there will never be a permanent cut to the gas and fuel tax. The government has said that they will cut the gas and fuel tax, but only if re-elected and only for a few months. Why is that? Why is tax relief for Ontarians only a good idea for a few months and only if the government is re-elected? Why won't the government cut gas and fuel taxes today and make the cut permanent? Thank you. I recognize the parliamentary assistant. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And again, I thank the honourable colleague for the question. Mr. Speaker, today, tomorrow, and every day since we've been elected, we've been fighting for Ontarians. We won't stop to do that, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, the uh, the latest uh, that, that that we announced after two very difficult years, Mr. Speaker, for Ontarians, and there were a lot asked of Ontarians, individuals and families, which is why, Mr. Speaker, we made sure that every single initiative that we put forward benefits Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you, on top of the four, the 5.7 cents liter in reduction in the fuel tax that the member uh, alluded to, and I hope that everybody in opposition votes in favour of this, Mr. Speaker, we also remove license plate fees. Thank you. Th thanks to the Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, removing tolls uh, on, for Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, and again, every, at every single uh, time that Mr. Speaker that we put these Answer. forward, the opposition votes against it. Well, we, but that's not going to stop us, Mr. Speaker. Every single day, we will work hard to make sure that we make life more affordable for the people Thank of Ontario, you. including members in her Thank you. I recognize the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Lundary. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, we all understand that our, our province's northern regions have different needs than those of the south. Whether it's a consequence of harsher wi winters, tougher terrain, or the often uh, remote landscapes, it's clear that living, working and doing business in Northern Ontario comes with a particular set of challenges. Speaker, through to you. How is this minister and our government leveling the playing field for Northern Ontario businesses and communities? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Northern Development, Mines and Natural Resources. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry, for his exceptional career in the advocacy for his constituents over the course of time. Mr. Speaker, uh, we've heard in recent weeks, in light of uh, the situation in Ukraine, uh, uh, that, that the world, Mr. Speaker, has come to the doorstep of Northern Ontario. And Sudbury is our flagship uh, city with all it has to offer, Mr. Speaker, uh, in the mining sector, the mining service and supply sector, needs to be ready for that, Mr. Speaker. Like Northern Ontario uh, communities uh, across some 800,000 square kilometres, we're ensuring that the quality of life in those communities uh, is where not just families who currently live there want it to be at, but where future families. We're on the move. We're growing, Mr. Speaker. That's why I announced, Mr. Speaker, Answer. more than three quarters of a million dollars for an open theater in the downtown core, enhancements of the Kiwi Park, Mr. Speaker, for also, trails, excellent. and of course, 105 mille dollars dans la Francaise scolaire public du And a $150,000 grant to four northern communities. I recognize the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, and for the hard work on shaping inclusive uh, Northern Ontario Heritage Fund has reshaped and success. I congratulate the minister and all those who have worked to create a better and broader entity for their efforts. I, have cer I am certain that these investments will prove equally as valuable to the communities as they will to those who receive them directly. After all, building and investing in businesses and the community infrastructure makes for better communities, creates jobs, and helps strengthen a community's core identity. And I think that that's a lesson that the Wynne Del Duca Liberals could reflect upon as they consider their tainted legacy of dismal stretch goals. Mr. Speaker, to the Minister, how is this government working to rebuild the tarnished relationships left by the previous government to improving Northern Ontarians' quite quality of life? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Northern Development, Mines and Natural Resources. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, during my visit to Sudbury, I also uh, announced an example of what the Northern Ontario Resource Development Program can do. We understand the impact of the resource sector on our, our towns and cities across Northern Ontario. Uh, I was able to announce uh, funding for Sudbury. Uh, to uh, develop uh, a roundabout, Mr. Speaker, which would divert some of the uh, resource uh, uh, traffic uh, in and around Sudbury. It was very well received by the Deputy Mayor, uh, Mr. Speaker. But really, this is about preparing all of our towns and cities for a reality, whether it's the forest sector or the mining sector. The United States of America, the European Union, have come a call in, Mr. Speaker. They want Northern Ontario to supply them with their forestry products and their mining uh, products, particularly uh, critical minerals, Mr. Speaker. But time and time again, all our investments Investments are met with Answer. resistance from the Liberal NDP coalition. The No Democratic Party, in particular, yeah, Mr. Exactly. Speaker, says no to growth and development in Northern Ontario. And the, the people there, Mr. Speaker, know it, and that's why they're rallying behind the progressive. Thank you. I 
recognize the member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. People in Thunder Bay, Atacokan and across the north are very concerned about the safety of our roads. My office received an email last week from a constituent with photos of yet another recent accident involving trucks. I have frequent phone calls about near misses, stretches that have regular accidents, and I know the government has heard about the famous Sistinen's Corner. Some conversations are harder because we have to talk about fatalities and serious injuries. I thank the OPP for a recent enforcement blitz, but where is the investment in infrastructure to make it safer? My caucus brings bills and motions forward and asks questions. When is this issue actually going to be taken seriously? When is this government going to get serious Answer. about boat safety in northwestern Ontario? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. On this side of the House, we take road safety very seriously, especially in the north where uh, winter, challenge, winter driving conditions can make uh, driving uh, even more challenging. Uh, we take winter maintenance seriously, Mr. Speaker. After 15 years of Liberal uh, government, um, things only got worse in the north. And so for the last four years, we've been taking important steps to improving the safety of, uh, of driving on northern roads um, in all sorts of ways, Mr. Speaker. With respect to infrastructure, though, Speaker, we have uh, taken important steps. I was in Kenora recently with the member, uh, with the Minister of Northern Development and Mines, to celebrate the expansion of Highway 17 from Kenora to the Manitoba yes, border. Speaker, we're expanding Highways 11 and 17 from Thunder Bay to Nipigon. But, Mr. Speaker. The member asks, where are the investments? The investments are in bills that our government puts forward that the NDP continuously oh, vote against, Speaker. Thank you. I return to the from Thunder Bay, out of Colton, for the supplementary. I'm glad the minister mentioned my question is for the premier. I'm glad the minister mentioned winter roads because we're having a snowstorm in Thunder Bay today, so just a uh, heads up. Another major concern on road safety are the transport trucks traveling the Trans-Canada Highway. Residents report that drivers are going too fast, especially on winter roads, when safety means driving below the speed limit. Our highways are not provided with equal plowing and salting to the 400 system in southern Ontario. There aren't enough transport inspectors, and we know truckers are under a lot of pressure to get their cargo to their destinations. We also know that there isn't enough training or testing to make sure the drivers are operating safely in winter conditions. That's an issue for both them and other drivers, like local residents who have to use Question. snow vehicles. When is this government going to do something to make sure northern highways are safe? Thank you. I return to the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, since, the, since our election in 2018, we have been taking important steps to ensure that roads are safe. We've, been in, we've, we've announced that we are building new rest areas and expanding existing rest areas across the north so, uh, to improve safety for truck drivers. Um, with respect to training, though, Mr. Speaker, Ontario has a very robust commercial licensing system in place. It's, in fact, among the most robust anywhere in North America, and we are committed to taking steps to ensure that it is upheld. The training standard includes a minimum of over 103 hours of instructor instruction, and it covers entry-level knowledge and skills that are needed for truck drivers to operate on Ontario's roads. Mr. Speaker, we are working. I'm working with the Minister of Colleges and Universities to ensure that organizations that provide training are, are, are designated and approved Answer. under the ministry's uh, certification program. And Mr. Speaker, the ministry and I have been in regular contact with the trucking industry over the last year to gather feedback on the effectiveness of that training program. We're going to take all the steps that we need to, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that our roads continue to be among the safest in North America. Thank you. I recognize the member from Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Despite the Premier's promise to stay away from cronyism, this government's track record on political appointment has been less than stellar. We've seen numerous examples of appointments that favour Premier's friends without seeing the qualifications of appointments uh, associated with the high-profile position that they've been appointed to. From the Ottawa Police Service Board to Dean French's appointment free for all, this government seems to choose who to appoint based on their donors list despite campaign pledges to the contrary. Will the government apologize for not taking politics out of the appointment process? 
Thank you. I recognize the government house leader. Uh, speaker, in fact, that's exactly what we did. Uh, we uh, saw that after years of uh, cash for access and uh, a whole host of, uh, of ethical challenges that the previous government faced, whether it was uh, uh, Air Orange and, and, oh my gosh, the list is just too much. I mean, we all remember windmills in communities that didn't want them for power that we didn't need, chief of staff going to jail of the previous, uh, of the previous Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, and the and the, the, I forgot about there's so many ethical challenges from the Wind Del Duca times that it is hard to keep up with all of them. But that all changed in 2018. We brought openness and transparency into government. We've made so many changes in this place alone to make Parliament work better for all people, Mr. Speaker, including giving the opposition or the minority. I should even say minority. The few Liberals that are left an opportunity to ask Answer. more questions, and imagine that they would ask a question on ethics. The Liberals would ask a question on ethics. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue doing all that we can to make this the best place to live, work, invest, and to raise Thank a family. You. And that the people of Ontario can tell. I turn to the member from Ottawa, Vanier, to the supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And having good ethics and appointment is a good thing. And appointing people you want to reward that don't have the skills required for a job has real impact on the services to Ontarians. When the media pick up on examples of evident favours being returned through appointments to high position, the public has good reasons to be concerned. Premier Floyd had committed to be more transparent with provincial appointments since elected. Yet, the numerous reports we see in the news every day clearly demonstrate that the government has broken that promise time and time again. So why is it that the Premier Order. did not bring the rigour and the transparency he promised to Ontarians? I recognize the government post leader. I mean, they, get, they get, I don't know how many questions they get uh, a week, very few, very few, and they ask this question now, Mr. Speaker. Now, let's, not that it matters, because in the, in the, in, with everything else that is going on in, in the world, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals are asking a question on ethics, uh, which they set the bar so low. Uh, I mean, again, we, we talked about chiefs of staff going to, uh, previous Liberal chiefs of staff, to the Premier going to jail. Uh, speaker, failed gas plants, uh, air orange, just on and on and on. But, Speaker, if the opposition wanted accountability for appointments, one would think that when they have the opportunity in front of the Government and Agencies Committee to actually vet those appointments, they would actually take that opportunity. But, of course, because they didn't show up and had no interest Answer. in it, the committee couldn't even meet, Mr. Speaker. I guess that means they believe that the appointments that we're making are good for the people of the province of Ontario, and they have shown that day in and day out because this is an Thank economy you. that is on fire, Mr. Speaker, and that's what the people of the province of Ontario care about. Thank you. I recognize the member for London, Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, I sent a letter with my colleague from Ottawa Centre to the Minister uh, Raymond Cho and Chief Commissioner. The member for Patricia Ottawa South and the Minister, Minister of Sport Culture will from... come to order. Speaker, I'll start again. Um, my question is to the Premier. Last week, I sent a letter to, with my colleague from Ottawa Centre to the Minister Raymond Cho and Chief Commissioner Patricia DeGuire from Ontario Human Rights Commission. We were raising a serious case of disability discrimination and have not heard a reply. Kismet Dog Rescue recently informed Aaron and Mike Doan of From Listowel that they're ineligible for a dog adoption. And why? Because their son Henry is on the autism spectrum. Speaker, we're thankful for the hard work of dog rescue agencies, and no one would question their need for a rigorous interview process to ensure adopted dogs go to safe Question. Homes. Speaker, we asked the minister responsible to take action. Will this government commit today to take action and make sure that the disabilities— Thank you. I recognize the minister for children's sport and community services. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, opposite for the question. There is no place for discrimination of anyone here in Ontario. Our government is committed to creating that environment, and we will continue to work on that. It was very disappointing to see that article uh, that the member is referring to. Uh, and as an owner of dogs, I appreciate the warmth and love that they can give uh, individuals and their families. Uh, every child with autism has unique needs, and we need to understand uh, how to address those needs. And I think that we will all agree on all sides of this House that discrimination is not acceptable, period. I'm pleased to see that the family worked with another shelter 
and that the family is now in the process of being matched with a dog. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the member from Ottawa Centre. Speaker, words are not enough. There is a dog rescue that continues to operate in the province of Ontario that says they will not let dogs go to families whose children are on the autism spectrum. That is still a functioning business that is in non-compliance with the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. This minister, this government, must stand up for the law. Disability discrimination should be illegal. My colleague's question got a little muffled there, Speaker, so I'm going to repeat it to the government. Is this government going to take action against Kismet Dog Rescue that continues to post on social media that they will continue to discriminate against autistic folks, against children who are autistic? They need animal companionship, Speaker, just like all of us who celebrate that. Are you going to act? Yes or no? That's Thank the question. You. I return to the Minister for Community, Children and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. Let me be absolutely clear. There is no place for discrimination against children with autism when their families are anyone else. Order, you asked the question. Let Listen me take this opportunity to explain you know, the, the unique needs of children with autism and their families and how our government is addressing that with a world-leading program that is creating a needs-based, comprehensive program to support the families with doubling of the funding, 50,000 children who are being moved into services as we speak, with 40,000 already in the programs, and we make sure that the program is evolving with the independent intake organization. The well-being of children with autism and their families is at the centre of everything we do at the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services and the children with special needs. So we're creating these programs. There is no room for discrimination of children with autism. Thank you. Next question, I recognize the member from Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This week, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a chilling report stressing that there must be rapid, deep, and immediate cuts to climate pollution. It's now or never for climate action. Yet this same week, the government introduced legislation to support fossil fuel consumption and accelerated their scheme to build the Bradford Bypass Holland Marsh Highway. It's clear the Premier's big, sprawl, expensive agenda clearly trumps climate action and adaptation. Speaker, we need to protect water, farmland, and wetlands. Our lives and livelihoods depend on it. That's why I've put forward a blue, bait, blue belt pl plan Question. to double the size of the green belt. Speaker, will the Premier say yes to clean water and local food and yes to our plan to double the size of the green belt? Thank you. I recognize the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker. And I thank the member opposite for that question. Speaker, what you really heard in that question was fundamentally no to any growth in the province of Ontario. Yep, yep. This Premier has said yes to record investments into transit. We're seeing tangible reductions in the largest source of GHGs being transportation. As we transition to electric vehicles, the only province and first province to launch clean transportation fuels. As we work with industry, we've seen a phase out of coal uh, from some of the largest industry emitters working with the steel sector for a six megaton reduction. Speaker, we've launched the largest wetlands restoration program in Ontario's history. In fact, I was just at, I was just at the Winkworth property in my riding to see a project that started Answer. in the 80s continuing to grow. Speaker, we understand that we have to plan for growth in the province of Ontario. That means the dignity of a new Canadian, a house over their head, here, as it was for my you. grandfather when he immigrated here, here. from Italy. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary, I return to the member from Guelph. Speaker, what you just heard in that answer is the government is saying yes to expensive big sprawl. I don't understand what the government has against local food and farmers. I don't understand why the government wants to refuses to protect Ontarians from flooding. I don't know why they want to continue to build these super sprawl, super pollution highways that we simply can't afford. Why does the government want to force people into expensive, long commutes, uh, spending time away from their family and friends, when instead we can build connected, livable, affordable homes in places near where we work? Will 
the government will the government take this opportunity to say yes to farmers Question. yes to local food yes to protecting us from flooding and yes to doubling the green belt thank you i return to the minister of conservation parks and environment speaker what you really heard it's so disappointing from that member opposite is no he said no to any future road or highway growth. We've said yes. And he says the member opposite wants us to listen to the science. The science in the environmental assessment said that gridlock is paralyzing growth of this province and future generations. Speaker, that member wants a, fo a farmer in rural Ontario to bike. That member is against the historic EV investments in this in this this province has made the leadership of this minister perhaps it's because he's against the critical mineral strategy because he'd rather see china succeed the communist party of china and he wouldn't like to see investments in the north martin falls and webequa led by indigenous and historic investments into ev historic investments the lowest carbon major transit project with Thank the you. ontario line we're going to keep doing that working with Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the member for Timiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, recently, the City of Hamilton made a decision not to expand their urban boundaries and to try and focus their housing strategy within their boundaries. The government, both the, Min the Minister of Municipal Affairs and the member of flamborough Lambert described that as anti-growth and anti-housing ideology. The question is, how can trying to protect Ontario's most precious resource, the best farmland in North America surrounded, and because it's got the best climactic conditions, a gift that we should be, do everything we can to protect, how can protecting that be anti-growth and anti-housing? I recognize the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, uh, thanks for the question. Um, Ontario is in, in the middle of a severe housing supply shortage driven by high demand. Uh, we, we've tabled a number of uh, solutions uh, and we're providing real, real uh, opportunities to get shovels in the ground faster. Again, New Democrats couch their words, couch their words uh, one way. But, you know, Speaker, when it comes to supporting our More Homes for Everyone plan, it's very simple. New Democrats are always going to vote against increasing housing supply. New Democrats are always going to vote against uh, protecting tenants. They're always going to vote against strengthening community housing. They've continually voted against and spoke against our call uh, to get more money out of the Answer. so we can build more community housing. Uh, you know, the choice, uh, Speaker, is very, going to be very clear. Do you want a party that says yes Thank you. opportunities, or do you want a party that says no? Thank you. That concludes question period for today. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, get you. the member from Ottawa South has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Government House Leader concerning Bill 88. This matter will be debated today following private members' public business. I recognize a point of order from the Minister of Sport, Culture and Tourism. Also here to speaker, and that's why I'm here today. Uh, I want to invite all members so I stop getting text messages. If you are wearing a tartan or any type of plaid, or you love to be Scottish just today, please join us on the, uh, on the uh, gallery over here, and we will get a picture taken. And we are really excited to celebrate uh, Jim McDonnell and his wonderful piece of legislation. Yeah. Not really a point of order, but we will all cherish the culture and sport and opportunity today. I recognize the member from Ottawa South on a point of order. Point of order, point of order, uh, Mr. Speaker. And this is not about pixie dust, so you can all stay calm. I'd like to wish my mother, Mary Fraser, a happy birthday. She turns 90 today. Yep. She's a pretty amazing, uh, pretty amazing woman, and when I asked her this morning, how does it feel to be 90, because I was with her this morning, came back here, and she says, it's hardly believable with a straight face, and, uh, but it is believable, Mom. We love you. Happy birthday. I'll see you tomorrow. 
It is not a point of order, but we all wish Mom a happy birthday. <laughs> if the House would just indulge me as it is uh, Scottish Heritage Day, I would normally do this from my seat, but obviously I can't do that today. Former MPP Bill Murdoch introduced the Scottish uh, Tartan Games, and today I would like to acknowledge him and his efforts, and also he's suffering from some pretty challenging health, so I would ask that the House send their prayers and wishes to him and his family as he struggles through his challenge. Thank you. This house stands recessed until 1 p.m. today.